Hi everyone, welcome back to the second half of political parties in the state of Texas. This is of course a continuation of political parties in government 2306. Let's get started. We are going to be talking about first the rise of the Republican Party. Now we were talking about the Democrats being in control for roughly a hundred years. Well we start seeing the Republicans start taking chances and actually winning some statewide elections. In 1961, Republican John Tower is elected to the U.S. Senate. This is the first time that the Texas citizenry elects a Republican senator. Now remember, this is all falling between that 1874 time period and 1990 when the Democrats are in control of state government. Now in 1978 and then again in 1986, Republican Bill Clements wins the governor's seat. He is the first Republican in office since Reconstruction. Remember, Reconstruction. In 1992, we see the Republicans hold both Senate seats at the federal level. And then in 1998 is when we see Republicans win every statewide election. This is just a representation of the changes in the number of Republican and Democratic office holders in Texas. As you can see, this is from a comparison from 1973 to 2011. You can see the change in numbers. From 73, where we had Democrats of 132 in the Texas House of Representatives, down to 51 Democrats in 2011. And you see the Republicans jump from 17 to 99. Slowly but surely, the Democrats lose office seats. And you see the state go from uh, blue to red. And you, the state, this is a representation of how we voted in the 2012 election when uh, then candidate Barack Obama was running against Republican John McCain. So we do see a conservative and moderate factions or parties, uh, divisions within the Republican Party. So the first one that we will talk about is the Fundamentalist Evangelical Christians. This is, of course, a faction. So it is a subgroup within the larger Republican Party. The group of Fundamentalist Evangelical Christians are very concerned with moral issues. These are the far right, far, far right uh, Republicans who are very concerned with anti-homosexuality, anti-abortion. They are very religious, very strongly fundamental Christians. Now the other group within the Republican Party is the economic and business group. This faction, this subgroup is concerned with lowering taxes, bettering business conditions. This group is more concerned that the fundamentalists, the fundamentalist evangelical Christians, will jeopardize the Republicans' ability to win elections. This faction is much more moderate when it comes to social issues. Now, we say there is temporary party organization, and this is because we have such a division between the parties at the local, state, and national level. When we talk about temporary party organization, we are talking about at the local level. This is precinct conventions, which are held in March, uh, normally in March. I think slowly but surely they are uh, getting further and further along uh, into the April and sometimes even as late as June. The precinct convention is the lowest level of party organization. This is that grassroots level. 
any voter who participated in the party's primary election may attend the precinct convention. However, attendance at the precinct convention is minimal. Usually only 2-3% to of those who voted attend precinct conventions. Now, the precinct convention is where you select delegates to go to the county and senatorial district conventions. That is where you will make policy resolutions for the party platform. Ladies and gentlemen, if you are ever interested in running for office, this is where you start. You start at your precinct convention. So the precinct convention is held in your neighborhood where you vote. These are your friends, neighbors, family members. These are the people you see every day. So if you have any inclination of ever running for office, this is your best, uh, this is your best shot at networking. Now this next chart here is so that you can see how uh, the difference is shown between the temporary organization of the party and what is considered the national organization. So you see the left and right columns and you see the arrows. So if you follow from the bottom, look up, you can see where you have your convention where your precinct is versus your county and state the national convention you do not need to know all of the arrows and how they follow one another in party organization but this is so that you can see just how you go from one level to the next Now the state convention, this is where you get the opportunity to actually have a say in the party platform, is held in June. Both the Democratic and the Republican parties in Texas hold state conventions in June of even numbered years. Now why is it in even numbered years? Well because you have to have an election in November of even numbered years so that you are prepared to start a new congressional session in the odd number years. So the major functions of the state convention are to elect state officers, elect the members of the state executive committee, adopt the party's platform, and of course certifying to the Secretary of State that the candidates nominated by the party in its March primary are the ones that they are uh, running for the general election in November. Now in presidential election years such as 2020, the convention, the state convention also elects nominees to the National Party Committee and it will select 38 presidential electors and it elects some delegates to the national convention. Now these are some excerpts from the Texas Democratic and Republican Party platforms. Now these are some older ones. If you guys are interested in the current platforms for the Democratic and Republican Party in the state of Texas, you can literally Google Texas Democratic Party platform and it will bring up the page that will take you to what the Democrats are uh, using as their party platform in 2020. The same thing for the Republican Party. I would encourage you to go and do that and search them out because it is very interesting what the two parties find uh, to be the most important things that they will be uh, focusing on and what they are looking to work on in the coming years. 
I encourage you really and truly to go look for them uh, for the 2020 parties and see what they are. Some of them are just um, rather interesting. If you find them and you have any questions or um, have any comments about what you have found, please be sure to email me and let me know. Now there is permanent party organization at the precinct level. We'll start there. Now the permanent party or the permanent structure of the party machinery or the system consists of people selected to lead the party organization and of course provide continuity between election campaigns. So these people as you will see are elected for a specific purpose. When it comes to the precinct level, the chair of the precinct is chosen for two years by, by the precinct voters at their precinct convention. Now the chair of the precinct is the organizer for the party activities in their precinct. They also preside over the precinct convention and they are allowed to serve as a member of the county executive committee. And this is what we call the grassroots level. At the county and state level, we'll start with the county here, the county senatorial district convention. This is what, where we find that they select delegates to the state convention and make resolutions for the party platform. In highly urban counties, the county convention has given way to state senatorial district conventions. In this instance, the permanent party organization consists of the chair who is elected for a two-year term and they are elected in the primary, in the party primary. And the county chair is the one who presides over the county executive committee. The county chair also determines the primary election places and appoints primary election judges. He or she is also responsible for accepting candidates for placement on the ballot, printing paper ballots and renting voting machines. Finally, the chair along with the county executive committee must certify the names of the official nominees of the party to the Secretary of State's office. Now, the executive committee. <clears throat> the executive committee, of course, is in charge of determining where the voting places will be located, appointing election judges, and also renting the machines for the state or the county, excuse me. Of course, they will also certify official nominees. Now, the committee has three major functions. Assemble the temporary role of delegates to the county convention. Canvas the returns from the, the primary for local offices. So they are to analyze the returns of the primary results. And they help the county chair prepare the primary ballot and accept filing fees and determine the order of the candidates' names on the ballot. Remember, that last one is probably the most important one because people are so uh, inclined to not know who they are voting for that they will vote for the first name on the list regardless of who they are. So sometimes being that f those first two names is a good indication that you can at the very least garner a runoff spot. Now, at the state level, we see the permanent party organization consists of the chair and an executive committee. Now, the chair, as we have uh, come to see, is selected at the state convention. Now, his or her duties are to preside over the state executive committee's meetings. They will call the state convention to order, handle the requests of statewide candidates on the ballot, uh, and certify the election's runoff primary winners to the state convention. Now the executive committee though, this is the state level permanent organization. It is a 64 member state executive committee. This includes two members from each of the state's 31 Senate or state senatorial districts and 
the last two uh, spots are for the chair and vice chair. Now the main legal duties of the state executive committee are to determine the site of the next state convention, canvas statewide primary returns, and certify the nomination of party candidates. Now their political duties include producing and disseminating press releases and other publicity. They are encouraging organizational work in precincts and counties, they raise money, and they coordinate special projects. Their job is to keep party loyalty and keep party in our minds. So this is just a graphic so you can see how Texas compares when it comes to party competition. We are what is considered strictly a one party state and at this moment it is Republican. The hope is that in the coming years we will not necessarily go to blue but go to what is now purple so that we would be a more competitive two party state. Now this is kind of an older graphic but you can see how it is trending that the majority of party affiliation is changing from as far back as 1952 to as you know uh, more recent 2008 we see the number of voters that are indicating uh, that they belong to a major party. It has progressively gotten smaller and smaller the percentage of people that are saying that they are strictly a one party person. As we have seen here more recently people are very much disappointed with their party choices. Um, while they tend to trend to one party or another more than not they are not happy with either party and of course we see these fringes of both parties that are becoming more vocal. So in the coming years it could be that the parties will change dramatically. For now we do still see a very strong two-party system although we are getting very uh, vocal and prominent factions from within both parties that are making their voices heard. So keep up with it so that you can see which party or even which faction you are more likely to fall into. Now when it comes to Democrats in the state of Texas, can they still be considered competitive? Well we have to consider party realignment. Now party realignment is the transition from one stable party system to another. What this refers to is a shift in partisan identification. This means how do we as voters identify ourselves? If people start identifying as one party, say you used to be identified as a Democrat and start identifying as the other party, say the Republican Party, that is considered a realignment. You have realigned your political ideologies. Now we do see some very specific reasons in realignment. When it came to the state of Texas, this realignment started with a very popular Republican president, Ronald Reagan. So Reagan was a moderate Republican. He was able to work with both parties, meaning he was able to work across the aisle. The 1980s were spurred or spurred the move by many upper middle uh, class Texans from the Democratic Party to the Republican Party. So you see these uh, upper middle class Texans go from Democratic to Republican because the Republican Party was strictly more conservative and the Democratic Party was not being very conservative where they were seeing these factions of the more uh, socially liberal coming to be. So party switching by native Texans has not been the only cause of realignment. A majority of recent domestic migrants, this is migration, domestic migration into Texas, 
is from other states that have been Republicans or independents. Of course, the long-term economic trends have benefited Republicans in the state of Texas, making money through the recession, which are normal things. So, so long as the economy in the state of Texas is stable and businesses benefit, you will see a more steady Republican trend. So if people are making us rich, or at least well off, then people will keep voting for those who we think are responsible, meaning the Republicans. So, so long as the economy is good in the state of Texas, then you will see the Republicans stay in office. However, there is something considered de-alignment. De-alignment is when voters are refusing to identify with either political party and are more inclined to call themselves independents. So this means we are paying more attention to the issues and candidates instead of the parties. This means that as voters and as political savvy citizens, we will vote across party lines. We are voting the issues, not the party. This, this happens when you become truly independent. This means you no longer align yourself with one political party. So this is when we see independence, we see split ticket voting, we see less partisan identification. We started seeing more of this and then we saw the 2000 and 2008 election and we saw a strict return to party identification in 2008. Now we are seeing more of this independent. Why? Because people are yet again not happy with either of the two parties. So keep a lookout for de-alignment. We are not talking about realignment, which is switching from one party to the other. We are talking about leaving the parties all together and focusing on the issues and the people who are running, not the parties who are supporting them. So this is when we say you become truly independent is when you stop seeing party politics. All right, so keep in mind and keep this question open when you move ahead from this course. Can Texas be a competitive democratic state, right? The reds, the Republicans versus the blue, the Democrats. Well, it's possible. The Democrats are actively working to make this happen in the state. Now, Texas has been a solidly red state for the last 20 plus years. Now, can we be purple? Now, the Republicans have worked to win Texas votes. They're having to now. The Democrats have to keep the women voters, minorities, Hispanics in mind. It, this is what's going to help the Democrats win in the state of Texas. It is thought that the Democrats can be competitive by 2025, which at this point is not that far away. So, ladies and gentlemen, it is up to you to go out there and vote and be be heard. Have your voice heard, whether it's for one party or another or no party at all. Remember, the best way for you to be effective is to vote. If you cannot vote for whatever reason, you are not excluded from the system. This means that there are other ways that you can help fundraise. You can help political campaigns. You can be a part of the process even if you do not vote. But remember, you cannot affect change without voting. So uh, make a choice, whether it be independent, left or right. Figure it out, guys. It's up to y'all. This is the end of political parties in the state of Texas. I look forward to speaking to you again on our final topic, which will be on voting. Until then, y'all have a good one.